So, I'd like you to picture an archive. You will probably think of a nothing at all. What on earth is an archive and what are archivists? In which case, welcome, hello. Or B, you will think of rows and rows of dusty stacked shelves like these ones in a sort of twilight gloom. And you're not wrong, that is what I do. Uh, these are the stores where I currently work at Chatsworth House in Derbyshire. I take in the material, I appraise it, so that's what we call deciding what to keep and what to discard. I arrange it in some sort of order, catalogue it, and put it in little neat boxes and put it on shelves and get angry if anyone actually wants to see it or use it. Uh, that last bit is a joke. Obviously, we do all our work so that people can actually use the information. But nowadays, as you're well aware, an archive can easily look like this. Because most records aren't written in ink on paper. They're in the form of bytes. I don't send a bunch of letters to my brother. I send him an email. Most of what was written on paper is now digital. And that causes archivists a lot of problems. First one is a problem of theory or organization. So traditionally, an archive is built out of static, singular records. One item would set information. That record is seen in the context of everything around it in a sort of hierarchical manner. So we talk a lot about the tree. This is an example tree from a, a collection I'm currently working on. It's the papers of Henry Cavendish, scientist from the 1700s. Don't worry, you're not supposed to read the small boxes. But it shows you that it's ordered from the fonds, which is a word not heard outside of archiving circles, to a subfonds, to a series, subseries, sub sub series, if you're feeling wild, file, then item. It's all very neat, it's all linear, and it's all static. It's the exact opposite of a digital record that can take no permanent singular form, like a relational database that can display different data in different ways, or even multiple drafts of the same document, or multiple copies of an email that are all on the same chain. Websites, big problem always changing, how do you capture that data, and in what form do you capture it? These kind of records really upset our systems. Then there's the obvious problem, the problem of size. So from the 1970s, there was a new wave of mass multiplication and duplication of records. With increased storage capacity, speed of computation, the ease of use of digital devices. In the old days, I could look through bundles of letters from a leading figure and decide what was worth keeping. Now, to sift through the hundreds of thousands of emails that are in a CEO's email inbox to find what's worth keeping just takes far too much time and it may not be worth the effort because how do you decide what to keep from that mass? And the third problem is a problem of preservation. Uh, now, from the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of fear in the archiving world about the huge variety of digital formats and software. That somewhat calmed down, but digital records suffer from longevity issues. I have lost count of the number of times I have been uh, told or heard the phrase, just scan it in as if making a paper record digital solves all your problems of access and preservation forever. You've found old photo albums, scan them in. You've got old house records, scan them in. But digital records are so more, much more fragile than paper. So this is a manuscript of the Lord's Prayer written in Latin with the English above it. It's from a royal prayer book from about 800 AD. I can still read that, I can still understand that manuscript today, 1200 years later. 
and all that was needed for its preservation was some sympathetic environmental conditions. And for me to scan it in to show you on the screen today, but that's okay. In contrast, a digital record relies on compatible, interdependent software and hardware, all items that become quickly obsolete and suffer from rapid degradation. Another illustration, uh, the UK Atomic Energy Authority, when they dismantled reactors and buried nuclear waste 20 years ago, they needed to ensure that information about that waste was left for future generations. Don't dig here. But the solution they came up with wasn't digital records, it was to print the instructions on acid-free paper and to put them in our archival boxes and preserve them in that way for the future. So, in the face of all these challenges of digital records, some leading archival thinkers, and there are some, thought that the best thing to do was to save everything possible and wait and see what solutions might arise. It wasn't possible or viable anymore to appraise material, to decide what to keep and what not to keep. Just save everything and get rid of archivists. But there's something about this that doesn't sit right with me. And I'll outline four key reasons why. It's not a new problem, the environmental impact. Some things are just not worth saving. And that there are benefits in forgetting. So the first, this really isn't a new problem. Archivists and the way we save information have been challenged and forced to evolve through many technological advances. From the time that humans discovered that making marks can pass on knowledge beyond our lifetimes, there have been new technologies developing the art of knowledge retention and access. So the first picture you see, the one on the left, that's a small selection of more than 30,000 clay tablets once held as Ashurbanipal's royal palace in Nineveh, modern day Iraq. It's from about uh, the seventh century BC. Um, and this picture actually comes from the British Library where most of the tablets are held. So this marking of curiform, triangular writing on clay tablets was a significant advance in technology. It demanded many innovations in terms of knowledge retention. This library shows the development of the idea of metadata, data about data, of title pages, of authentication devices, and the earliest attempts to arrange records to allow that information to be used in future decision making. The second picture is to illustrate uh, the time of the invention of the printing press in the 1440s to the 1450s. So the printing press, a movable type, led to the beginning of the mass dissemination of data. It spread knowledge wider and faster than anything before on every topic, idea, and theory, all suddenly available to everybody who could read. There were more books made in the first 50 years after the printing press, after Gutenberg's Bible was published, than in the preceding 1,000 years. And at the time, there was worries that this wild, uncontrolled spread of information would impact society negatively. How on earth could people tell good and bad information? All these worries that echo in our world today. So every technological innovation precipitates a period of overproduction, an information inflation that overpowers our ability to manage what we produce and we've dealt with them all. So I have optimism that this one will be dealt with just as well, but possibly not by giving up and saving everything. Second argument against this total storage idea is the environmental impact of an approach. It's difficult to find data on the environmental impact of digital archiving practices, but Self-evidently, storing, processing, accessing, using these digital records are all going to generate some impact. For archives in particular, there was a widespread increase in the use of virtual exhibitions post-COVID, 
there's digitization of collections, and there's a digital preservation best practice system that relies on multiple backups and constant updates, which mean a significant use of cloud computing and other ICT. So on the one hand, the use of the cloud leads to greater environmental efficiencies in terms of economies of sale, super efficient cooling systems, the use of renewable energy, increased storage density, and increased processing efficiencies. But on the other hand, data centers already accounted for 1% of the total electricity demand in 2018. That means that it's a carbon footprint on a par with the aviation industry's fuel emissions. There's a suggestion that some of the largest providers are not entirely transparent about their environmental data, which means it's difficult to manage and assess the environmental impact of data centers. But the strain is being felt. Um, so throwing the spotlight on my homeland in Ireland, this is one of the many data centers located outside Dublin. 14% of Ireland's national electricity in 2021 was used by data centers. And two years ago in 2022, Airgrid, which is the state-owned uh, national grid company, issued a moratorium on connecting new data centers to the grid for the foreseeable future due to concerns about energy security. Then you have tales from other countries. So there was reports uh, from the Netherlands that one data center was using 84 million liters of water during a declared drought. I'm sure there are many people here that can have a whole debate on the environmental pros and cons uh, of the cloud. But on a basic level, saving everything is clearly a greater environmental burden than selective retention of records with a caveat that it may depend how that selection is ca carried out. To reduce the volume of what we store means we reduce the burden of the storage and the processing of those records. And I guess what I find particularly disturbing is that the use of the cloud disassociates its physical impacts with its users. Most people simply don't think and wouldn't notice the environmental impact of storing thousands of photos on their personal drives. Why would we? It's so easy, and it takes more time and effort to select the photos that we actually want to keep. But I don't think archivists, I don't think we can ignore the environmental impact of our work, particularly by neglecting to assess what is really worth keeping. Third, there's a ph philosophical argument about the need to discard records and to forget. If we rely on technology to save everything, we reduce our own skills to actively select and remember. Think about how you probably know your childhood home's landline number, but you couldn't now rattle off anybody's number in your phone book. Why do we need to forget? And why do we need to choose what we remember? On a societal level, deleting is an important function in human decision making, one that permits us to generalize and to abstract from individual experiences. It empowers societies to be open to change. Think for example of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission post-apartheid, or the aftermath of Ireland's uh, 1922 civil war. This is a picture of Michael Collins signing the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921. Except neither of these two examples is foolproof, but they are the best examples I can give you about the society's need to move forward and to forget. On a personal level, what we choose to keep can be random, it can be illogical, but it shows us to be human. So in my archival boxes, there are hundreds of legal documents kept for legitimate legal purposes, but it's the odd bits and bobs that tell us what being human is all about. Here we have a stitch taken out of uh, Deborah Mitford's dog, <laughs> uh, one of the Mitford sisters. And then we also have the classic archival stereotype, there are many bags of hair. Uh, and this hair in particular 
as taken from a haircut of a little boy who then died shortly after his second birthday. Can AI really read our hearts and souls, this peculiar mixture of sense and sensibility, sentimentality, and decide what we want to remember? I guess my fear here isn't unlike many people focusing recently on this question of what makes us human. And I'm sure there are lots of you out there who will reassure me on this point. And I look forward to those conversations. On a side note, some people have also examined this question about the function of forgetting from a biological or evolutionary perspective, um, which makes for very interesting reading. The idea that human cognitive adjustment is a biological adjustment. And maybe we will evolve yet again to adjust in this new information environment. But when technology offers the ability of instant recall, this individual impulse to remember withers away. And if we don't preserve and retrieve, and if those mechanisms are not balanced by ones that stimulate participatory engagement, electronic memory might lead to a sort of collective amnesia. We need to make an effort to select what we want to remember. Fourth argument, I think, is the most obvious one. Not everything is worth saving. Drowning under the data means that people struggle to find the information that's of value. So 64.2 zettabytes of data were created, captured, copied, and consumed globally in 2020. And by 2025, that overabundance um, of global data creation will grow to more than 180 zettabytes. This infobesity has existed for some time. So from the 1970s, it was characterized by the failing of the filing cabinet system, by piles of paper, and by worker stress. Currently, it results in an inability to access records reliably and swiftly, along with a relative incompetence in searching for the information that one actually requires. For organizations, this means that money and staff time are wasted trying to locate records and recreating records that they were not able to successfully retrieve. Coupled with this, we become unsure about how to judge the information we receive to the point where the data contained in the records could be disregarded. There's no way for people to figure out what reliable, good information is on which to make informed decisions. Who do you trust? What information sources do you trust? And how can you be sure of that? The other flip side of this infobesity is a lack of information. So because we don't actively choose what we are keeping, we risk losing records that are valuable. An employee leaving their company doesn't leave behind a filing cabinet full of papers that can be assessed for permanent retention, but a Microsoft OneDrive account, which can be deleted instantly without thinking about its contents. WhatsApp messages can be deleted uh, in several days. See the March 2023 government guidance after the COVID inquiry. Website communities can be lost by a single decision of the host company to stop the hosting. So those are my arguments in favor of appraisal and a continuing need for archivists to carry out this task. Search engines, AI, this is all held up again as the answer to the world's problems. Um, there is now a standardization for cataloging data, metadata across archives, and that has led to collaborative, connected archival networks. So there's standards called EAD and Dublin Core. What we used to do was we had paper catalogues that people could look through in the offices, or at a push, we had a Word document available online somewhere for somebody to have a look at. And now we have all sorts of software solutions running across various organizations where users can sift through thousands of records from multiple sources. The National Archives are doing some really interesting work using machine learning to automate the bulk of the appraisal process so they can make informed decisions about what records are retained, especially because they conduct a lot of the more routine government document appraisal work. 
the very least, the software can eliminate um, redundant and duplicate records. But the problem is, <laughs> archiving is quite a small niche industry which requires bespoke software from an industry that's already in demand. And there is a real need there if anyone wants to exploit that and talk about machine learning appraisal software for archivists. So I don't think we're in a position where technology will solve all our problems. Uh, we should save everything and I should be handed my P45. I think I see a role for archivists going forward, but it won't be in the stacks those dusty shelves where we've always seen ourselves. We need to engage in new technologies. That's why I'm here at this festival. And you need archivists to deal with all of those records because we are uniquely placed in thinking of terms of hundreds, if not thousands of years, not just about freeing up server space for the next few months. Maybe we should change our job title a little bit, record organizer, knowledge manager, and blend in with all those new roles in information and knowledge management, security and database science, information rights that have evolved. So there is a purpose in actively deciding what to keep. Don't store content if you don't have to. If you do keep it, delete it as soon as you can. Think carefully about how and where you keep it. How do you decide what to keep? If you're asking me, there's a couple of ideas from the archiving world. We have a tried and tested utilitarian approach, a use-based approach where you think, okay, what is this record used for? What might it be used for in the future? So we talk about primary usages and secondary usages. Good example is a will. Its primary use was legal. And then its secondary use will be family historians in the future. So that's why we keep those. So you can think about what, what, will this, what use is this record? Why would I keep it? What use is it for? Second approach might be to think in terms of a risk-based assessment. What is the risk if I destroy these records? What level of risk am I comfortable accepting? What's the likelihood of that risk? How do I prioritize it? The third, more wild idea uh, of, of how you might decide what to keep is we could have digital expiry dates built into software. So when you save a record, you're asked for how long you want to save it for. And then you have a warning come up. You have records about to expire. Would you like to review them? And that sort of forces us to confront the problem in a way that piles of paper used to. So those are some ideas for you to think about. And the next time some record manager screams at you to tidy up your share drive, delete a few emails, maybe listen to them because they will be possibly the one person in your organization who cares about this stuff. And I hope I've persuaded you that somebody still has to. Thank you very much.